everyone. We're live and it's so awesome of you to join me. I know um, I did advertise this with my practitioner newsletter, which is a pretty large um, group of people. So you might be joining me from all over. If you're a practitioner, you're in for a huge treat today. As you always know with Bob Miller, we go deep and we go technical. If you're just a person who found us on Facebook and doesn't know what you're getting into, be ready for a ride because uh, this isn't for the lightweight. Uh, we're gonna go deep into genetic pathways and perioxynitrate and some really amazing things, but I promise you it'll be interesting. Um, so I wanna introduce our guest first, and then I wanna ask him a few basic questions and then we'll dive right in. And he actually, she even has some slides to share because when we're dealing with this kind of stuff, it's so much easier to have a visual. So I'm excited that he'll be sharing that and telling us more about it. Just a little housekeeping, um, feel free to share uh, as we're live. This will be recorded so you can find the recording here on Facebook and you can also find it on my YouTube channel, just Jill, Dr. Jill Carnahan on YouTube. That may be a day or so tell us up, but it will be there as well. And um, I am delighted to introduce my colleague and esteemed friend, Dr. Bob Miller. Um, Dr. Bob Miller is trained in a nat uh, naturopathic specialty. And as you know, I think I've had more naturopaths on my Facebook lives than medical doctors. I always joke I was born with the heart of a naturopath because um, I love how we delve into the same things and the solutions there are not just drugs and surgery, they're really based on a much more natural approach. And I always find I learned so many things from my naturopathic friends, they're some of the smartest people I know. So I'm delighted to introduce Bob Miller. He actually specializes in the field of genetic specific nutrition. What you're going to love about him is he's going to dive into pathways you've probably never seen before unless you're a practitioner who's studying this stuff, um, but it's so relevant to some of the details. And if you're out there listening as a patient, Bob is the kind of guy that can help you find um, kind of hard to, to pin down pieces of your puzzle and some of the pieces that might have been uh, missing in your doctor who treated you or a nutrient, like why did I react to that one? So as we dive into that, some of that might start to make sense. Um, he earned his traditional degree from Trinity School of Natural Health and is board certified through the ANMA. And in 1983, he opened the Tree of Life practice where he served as traditional nat naturopath for 27 years. For the past several years, he's been engaged exclusively with functional nutritional genetic variants and related research specializing in nutritional support for those with chronic Lyme disease. So any of you listening out there, I know that hits a lot of you, and um, it's sad. Um, we'll briefly talk about that at the beginning, but Bob, I know this is epidemic in its nature, and you're in Lancaster, is that right? Yes, so Lancaster County. You're a part of Lyme country. Um, tell me just a little bit about how you got into um, functional genomics and your pathway even to naturopathic medicine. Sure, well, it's an interesting story. Uh, naturopathic, traditional naturopathy is my second career. Uh, I was in electronics and uh, in the cable TV industry. And in my early 30s, I came down with a very severe case of ulcerative colitis. That's where the colon becomes very inflamed and you're bleeding. I was in the hospital for 21 days, lost half my blood, then I hemorrhaged. Remember vividly the night if it wasn't sure if I was going to make it till the morning. And uh, of course, the, the recommendation was take out the colon. But, you know, here in Lancaster County, I'm a bit of a stubborn Dutchman. So we, uh, I thought there's got to be other ways. So I started uh, digging and just became fascinated and haven't uh, turned back yet. So uh, I was second career. And uh, of course, having an electronics background, we think in schematics and pathways. So when I was introduced to uh, genomics, it just made so much sense. But this is just like an electrical circuit. And if you follow the electrical circuit, you can go back to where the, uh, the dysfunction is. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of the history. Bob, I love this because I had no idea. We have some real parallels of our journey. First of all, I was bioengineering, so all this, not electrical, but very same idea of pathways and, and that. And I love, that's why I love talking to you. And then I think, you know, I had Crohn's disease, which is a cousin to ulcerative colitis. And I had the same thing. My doctor said, you're going to need drugs and surgery for the rest of your life. There's no other way. It's incurable. We ironically have quite a similar journey, don't we? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. That's amazing. Well, um, I'd love to talk about um, what, first of all, let's go really basic on what is perioxynitrate. And feel free to share whenever you want your slides. Sure. And, and um, get the basics of what are we talking about here and how does that relate sure. to disease? Yeah, I'm the trying place. to share and I'm getting a message at host disabled participants. Okay, let me do this. Yeah, multiple. Okay, I think I just corrected that. See if that works. 
Is there that, we go. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. It's like the door locks on the child group, <laughs> right? You're so, <laughs> child well, exactly. door locks are on. Exactly. Now they're off. <laughs> so, there we go. So uh, again, our subject today is uh, functional genomics and uh, peroxynitrite. And uh, here's what we hope to learn today. And that is, uh, you know, what's functional genomics? What's peroxynitrite? And then we're going to very quickly get into five pathways that uh, peroxynitrite uh, might be made. And of course, you know, the disclaimer, you know, we're not a geneticist here. We're using uh, functional medicine to help physicians uh, as a clinical assistance tool. And of course, we're not giving any uh, medical advice here. Uh, now, here's the, the basic premise, and that is poor diet and environmental factors when combined with genetic variants in our DNA might cause an increase in toxic substances and then a decrease in critical nutrients and molecules needed for optimal health. So here's functional genomics. It's no longer that model of treating or take this for that. So rather than suppressing a symptom, we're focusing on either finding a potential nutrient deficiency or an excess of a, of a toxic or harmful compound in the body. And, you know, we think of genetics as where did I come from? What diseases might I be susceptible to? Functional genomics isn't that. We're looking at pathways and it gives you clues because genetics is just a predisposition, as I like to say. So when you see these genetic mutations, you use that as to, you know, where to put your uh, detective hat on and dig deeper with, uh, with labs. And then as we compensate for those nutrient deficiencies or support the detoxification, the body returns back to homeostasis. Now, this is one of my favorite sayings. This is a 3D chess game played underwater. You know, some people like to think, oh, what SNP do I have and what do I need to take for that? I think we're going to find that that's, you know, way oversimplified and it's not quite that simple. Uh, thinking that you need methylfolate because you have MTHFR sometimes does more harm than good. And we have to be looking at this globally, looking at it from a genetic, epigenetic, and cofactors, because there's so many things that uh, come into play. Now, in the traditional naturopathic philosophy, I had this picture drawn, and it says, when the house is burning down, don't wash the windows and mow the lawn. Because way too many times, I've seen this from practitioners, they, someone's really inflamed and they start trying to support methylation or trying to get the mitochondria going and it backfires because they're in such a state of inflammation. Now, for those who are, are new to this, we're just gonna go very briefly through uh, genetics. There, you know, our genes is what makes us human and just minor variations makes us unique. Now, a gene is nothing but a section of DNA that provides instructions for protein synthesis. You know, one of the things I'm amazed with, I mean, what a miracle we are in our creation. We eat fats, carbohydrates, proteins, we drink water, we breathe air, and we're exposed to sunlight, and everything gets made from that. I mean, I just sit back and just marvel at the miracle of that, how that all works. Well, it's the DNA that makes the enzymes that makes that happen. And you know, many people have heard of SNPs, and uh, that stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. And that can make us a little bit unique, and it's a variation in a gene. And that SNP then can sometimes lower the function of that enzyme. As we said, enzymes take one substance, turn it into another, and if we have SNPs, that's not optimal. Now, this is inherited from mother and father. Each parent passes on one of their two sets of genes, and this is how it works. If a father has a gene variant and a mother has a gene variant, there's a couple of options that can occur, and that's why the same parents can have multiple children and their genetic patterns are quite different. And here's another one on a homozygous genome, how it gets passed on to the children. So that's why sometimes parents can be carriers of disease. Both parents are fine, the child has a problem. Now, our genes are not our destiny. Uh, I didn't coin this phrase, but I love it, and that is that genes load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. And I believe that we are being exposed to so many environmental factors 
that our parents and grandparents weren't exposed to. And I believe that's why we're seeing such an increase in so many concerns. So epigenetics means the addition to changes in the genetics. And that's all the things that we're exposed to, the plastics, the electromagnetic fields, uh, the genetically modified foods, the growth hormones given to the animals, the degassing uh, of some of our uh, materials that we use, the lead that we use to put in our gas, all of those things are having an impact on us. And Bob, if I can just say a real quick comment. Gosh, I just want to stop here because, you know, environmental toxicity mold is such a big deal for my patients. And I really see this as the elephant in the room. So that is the thing that's different from 10 years ago, even for sure, 50 years ago. But I remember when I first started 15, 20 years ago, I'd have a very simple case of Hashimoto's hypothyroid or some other autoimmune disease. And it'd be fairly straightforward. They get well fairly quickly. And nowadays we have this... Um, set of very complex infectious load and toxic burden. And so I'll, I don't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to make sure that our listeners know this toxic load, if you're wondering, well, why is it so much worse now? Why are so many more people getting sick from the virus? This is part of the puzzle. It's our environmental toxic load is overwhelming our natural immune defenses. And we finally got to that tipping point, haven't we, Bob? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I would concur completely. And that's why I will talk about this later. I'm having a conference for health professionals, September 18 to 20, three days on mycotoxins. And I'm like you, when we see those people that are having challenges, uh, eight times out of 10, they're being exposed to mold and mycotoxins. And actually, I'm going to be showing you the enzyme that that is upregulating that I think will be quite fascinating. Bob, so, I can't wait. I'll be there. And if you're a professional, I will talk about this at the end. We'll share links, but stay tuned for September 18th through 20th because you'll want to be there. Bob, I wanted to just say something else. The mold is such a big deal. I'm the mold expert. I deal with mold all the time. But even for me, I'm always careful to go in with a blank slate with my patient and not assume there's any mold. But over and over and over again, we get to the end of the puzzle and realize, oh my goodness, this patient too has a mold exposure. So thanks for saying that eight out of 10 because it's so common. Absolutely. Now this slide is showing us that when we do have that mutation, stepping in with compensatory things actually brings you back into balance. And this is just a quick study on how riboflavin uh, has an impact on the status of homocysteine lowering effect of folate in relation to the MTHFR genotype. All right, to answer your question, peroxynitrite. This is just one of the many things that puts the house on fire, so to speak. Now, what it does, there's a very important molecule called nitric oxide, and we need that for circulation. We'll talk about that. And then a rather nasty free radical called superoxide. And this has an important role in chronic inflammation, immunity, and aging. And I'll show you how mycotoxins actually stimulate the production of peroxynitrite. It's hypothesized to play a key role in various degenerative states. And several analyses suggest that selenoproteins, particularly the selenium-dependent enzyme glutathione peroxidase, may have an important role in the detoxification and in elimination. I find it interesting, uh, the symbol for peroxynitrite is, oh no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yes. Uh, broad spectrum antioxidants, uh, vitamin E, melatonin, may be a part in preventing the formation of peroxynitrite. Uh, peroxynitrite formation rises 100 fold for each 10 fold increase in superoxide and nitric oxide production. So, what we're saying here is that superoxide generation is a potential mechanism that disrupts nitric oxide. And we'll be talking about that. And I've been, you know, talking about superoxide for probably 10 years probably within the last two to three months that I've just looked at it anew and said, this is likely more significant than, uh, when, than we realized. All right. So Bob, would it make sense to the theory that I've been hearing with why the antioxidants like zinc and vitamin C and um, even uh, minerals can be so powerful with viral infections is that this, uh, anti uh, this free radical state is part of the thing that allows pathogens to proliferate? Would Absolutely. You yeah, absolutely. I mean, that goes back to the traditional naturopathic philosophy 75 to 100 years ago, when, you know, traditional folks said these people are quacks that should be in jail. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Uh, but now, you know, the, the science is coming out and uh, proving it to be true. We're right all along. <laughs> yeah. So nitric oxide, I'm sure people have heard of it. It's in the cardiovascular and nervous system. It has a very short half-life. And it's actually won the Nobel Prize all the way back in uh, 1998. Nitric oxide is critical for blood pressure, preventing thrombosis, preventing leukocyte adhesion to vessel walls, increases the flow of nutrients to critical organs, and improves the efficiency of waste removal. Now we're gonna talk about superoxide. Inside the cells, sometimes an electron flies off, combines with oxygen, and that makes what's called superoxide. And this superoxide has been hypothesized to be a potent key player in the aging process. All right, now we're gonna start to geek out here. So hang on to your hat, here we go, okay? I'm gonna get my drawing tool here and uh, we're just gonna have a great time. So one of the things that uh, we need is this nitric oxide that we spoke about. And the nitric oxide is down here. Vasodilator and electron donor. Now it's quite a complex process to get there. We need a substance called BH4, tetrahydroboroptin. Now things can go wrong here. Aluminum can suppress that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's something called the urea cycle in the kidneys that clears ammonia. And these are the genes involved in that. And if we have any genetic mutations or anything else that goes on, that excess ammonia will also use BH4 to be cleared. That's why ammonia levels are so important. Mm -hmm. Now, we're gonna talk later about NADPH, my favorite molecule. Me too. Yes, NADPH combines with BH4, oxygen, and something called arginine. Then the enzyme, NOS, takes it all and makes nitric oxide, unless something goes wrong. After BH4 is used, it turns into BH2. We can have genetic mutations in these enzymes that don't allow it to come back. We're gonna talk later about the NADPH steel, where NADPH is used to actually make free radicals. Mm -hmm. You'll notice there's also heme right here. Heme is a cofactor, and there's eight steps that we need to make that heme. And look who we have here glyphosate. Ah. Glyphosate can impact the glycine that's needed for this heme cycle. Wow. These are people that often get hangry. They're, they get very upset and angry if they don't have food on a regular basis. So what happens if something goes wrong here? Oops, we make superoxide. That combines with that very important nitric oxide for, oh no, peroxynitrite. And guess what that does? It further suppresses BH4. And this feedback loop just keeps going. Gotcha. And that's why sometimes people will take L-arginine, thinking that, oh, I'm going to build my nitric oxide levels. And all they do is hurt and get some uh, viral infections. So Bob, I want to just make some a few things, things that are ahas for me clear, because I bet your listeners are saying the same thing. First of all, aluminum, sources of aluminum, super common, right? Um, I can think of obviously cooking in tinfoil, aluminum, um, antiperspirants, which is why we should only be wearing deodorants. Um, do you know any other, I mean, vaccines nowadays, they contain a lot of aluminum. And again, I am not your anti-vaccine person, but we have to think about load and all of this. I'm actually checking every patient right now with aluminum levels. You would not believe the load I'm finding of aluminum. So that's a really big deal. Ammonia, um, I know the gut can produce ammonia, um, some sorts of dysbiosis in the gut, especially bacterial and parasitic. Um, any other sources of common for ammonia in patients that you know of? Well, sometimes eating too much protein, not chewing well, and plus genetic mutations yes. in the urea cycle. Okay. And then glyphosate, clearly non-organic food. If you're not eating organic, you're going to get that on. And now we know even organic California wines have traces of glyphosate. So you can't be too careful with that. Absolutely. And I forgot to point out lead. Yes. Lead inhibits NOS. Mm. And of course, we had lead paint many years ago, lead on our gasoline. So if you have aluminum and lead, your ability to make nitric oxide is compromised. This yeah. is where people get cold hands and feet, mm -hmm. rain odds, high blood pressure. 
And we'll show later how important nitric oxide is. And so just this, using arginine is not the solution. I just want to reiterate that. There's a way bigger pathway here that you're going to explain to us. Absolutely. So here's the potential genomics. I'm not going to read them. Those are all the things that could go wrong that make it difficult. Uh, the lead, aluminum, and the glyphosate. And here's again as we can support function. Okay. SAMI, acetylmethionine and methyl folate or royal jelly, can actually help you make more BH4. Yucca, larch, citrulline, and L-ornithine can help that urea cycle. Interestingly, witch hazel and rosemary will scavenge peroxynitrite. SOD will help you neutralize that superoxide so you don't chew it up. Pomegranate, green coffee bean, garlic, and hawthorn all support the NOS enzyme. So there's a lot that can go wrong in there. And that's why when we do, when we train our doctors on how to do this, uh, looking at this is one of the first things we look at. Because again, cold hands and feet, uh, mm -hmm. varicose veins early, uh, hemorrhoids, all of those things can be related to that NOS uncoupling. Now I'm gonna move over to iron. We all know iron's critical. I mean, if we don't have iron, we don't carry our oxygen, life doesn't exist. However, something can go wrong. So let's look here. So there are genetic mutations that people have very high in English, Irish, and Ashkenazi Jewish that cause them to overabsorb iron. And that was actually adaptive. The, the Irish during the potato famines, if they absorbed more iron, they actually did better. But today we don't have famine and we're putting a lot of iron in foods. So what can go wrong here? Again, we talked about the body will make superoxide sometimes on its own. We need superoxide dismutase to turn that into hydrogen peroxide. However, then we need something called catalase to turn that into water and oxygen. We need glutathione peroxidase to turn it into water. And we need thriodoxin to turn it into water. Now, glutathione and thriodoxin, they donate electrons. And you'll hear this a lot. Look who's needed to keep recharging yeah. NADPH. Is this where hydrogen can be helpful because that's a donor for either um, a, the hydrogen tabs or the inhaled? Would that be in this tab? Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. right here we are. So what happens is when that iron is in excess or it doesn't even have to be in excess, combines with hydrogen peroxide to make what's called a hydroxyl radical, which damages protein, carbohydrates, and DNA. So here's where your hydrogen water can come in and neutralize that hydroxyl radical. But we need NADPH, glutathione, thriodoxin, catalase, a lot can go wrong in here. This is the most common thing I see. And actually it's what won me the research award in 2016 at the Helsinki uh, ILADS meeting showing that those with chronic Lyme were five times more likely to have one of the genes that would cause them to absorb more iron. Mm. Now, one of the ironies is many times people say, well, I can't be absorbing more iron because I've always been told I'm anemic. Well, of course, if this is happening, if this excess iron is coming down here, you're making more hydroxyl radicals. And then if a well-meaning practitioner says, oh, I'm going to make you feel better by giving you iron, if this is occurring, you'll actually make the person worse. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is get these pathways going, then you have all the iron that you need. This is called the Fenton reaction, named after Dr. Fenton, who discovered this in 1895. Now, what continues to happen here? So this OH minus will stimulate INOS, which is another form of nitric oxide, combined with, uh, again, to make peroxynitrite. Now, on this drawing, we showed how this also leads to something called carbonate radical CO3, which oxidizes your DNA. Mm. This is actually DNA damage that can occur. So this is a very dangerous process. And that's why, as we said, hydrogen water, those tablets or the air that you breathe or hydrogen machines, can be one of the most important things. If, if someone said to me, Bob, you can only take one thing. There's a new law that you can only take one thing, call it, I'd have to say hydrogen water. 
Bob, I couldn't agree more. And people forget they're cheap, they're easy. Now the inhaling machines, which I have in my office, I use when I'm doing charts three, two, three days a week, I use it. I love it. I feel so good. That's a $5,000 machine. Not everybody can get that, but everybody can afford the hydrogen tabs. So I, I agree. I highly recommend those as a, an adjuvant therapy and an easy Absolutely. Machine. I was just using my hydrogen machine before the call just to make sure my brain was- uh, I love it. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to read these, but these are all the genetic mutations that can cause this to go awry. Again, glyphosate, hydrogen water, skullcap clove alpha-lipoic acid can support the proper use of iron, SOD, catalase. We'll talk about this later. Nicotinamide mononucleotide uh, supports the production of NADPH. And also, uh, copper is needed to make ceruloplasm. Mm -hmm. And there's also many times mutations in the beta carotene to vitamin A. And uh, we need vitamin A and, of course, selenium for your glutathione peroxidase. Now, the beauty of looking at the genomics is you can see where you need the support. Now, EMF, uh, there's just more and more information coming out about this. And uh, I think we're going to look back someday and say, oops, uh, because good intentions. You know, I often give the analogy, you know, think of asbestos. What a wonderful thing because the houses didn't burn down and people didn't die. But then there's that unintended consequence. You know, we thought lead would make our world better by making our paint better and making our gasoline more effective. Oops. I'm mm -hmm. afraid we're on that same path. Now, what happens is we have membranes that store electrical potential across their membrane in the form of an iron gradient. And this stores the electrical potential. Well, what happens when we're exposed to EMF? That electrical potential goes up. This is a new chart we literally made days ago. Wow. So here's calcium, and there's a gene called CACNA1C, and it's responsible for the calcium coming in. Now, once it gets in, it turns into calcium calmodulin. Now, I've never seen a genetic mutation more accurate than this one. Mm. Mutations on this, I've never seen anybody who didn't have it, who didn't tell me that they're sensitive to EMF. They're more impacted by EMF. And this, of course, creates inflammation on its own. But since we're talking about the, uh, the peroxynitrite, what does the EMF do? It creates the nitric oxide, mm -hmm. the superoxide from the EMF, and makes the peroxynitrite. Yet another method to make inflammation inside the cell. One of the things I, and truly question, I don't say this is a fact, but Bob Navio has done some great work on the cell danger response. And I have to wonder if this is not a factor involved in the cell danger response when the body's just kind of in that half shut down trying to preserve itself because inside the cell, all of this is, uh, is going on. So that's why, you know, making sure you're not sitting next to your router all day, not carrying your cell phone on your body, mm -hmm. uh, use speakerphone or uh, earbuds, not the type that you put the transmitters in your head, but like those at least wired or, or air ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often tell people that uh, who have this as their severe problem, you need to make your house very dumb. Do yeah. not have a smart home. <laughs> Yes, I couldn't agree more. And I would say if you, if you are sensitive, you need to get wired internet, of course. Um, I still have Wi-Fi. I'm actually not as sensitive. I probably should. A lot of my friends just recently said, Jill, you know better. You need to get wired. So I'm probably going to be doing that. But right now I have a router cover um, that protects me. And I had a, a building biologist come to my condo here and check everything out. And there's a meter they'll put on your body to see the voltage. And then they'll check as they turn switches and check electricity. My measured body meter voltage was over 3000 with the, on the bed, I just laid in my bedroom on my bed um, with the normal, no special lights, nothing special on. When I turned the master bedroom switch off, it went to less than 200. That was a shock to me, which means I have an appointment to get a master switch with a remote so that at night I can turn off the electricity just in my bedroom by remote. And I would highly recommend if you have the resources to get a building biologist to come check um, your home as well. When you say it was a shock to you, no pun intended. Right, exactly. 
And Bob, the funny thing was, I would tell you, I'm not really EMF sensitive. I mean, I do wear bioelectric shields. I protect myself. I do a lot of things, but I don't feel physically that ill from it, like on the spot. However, as soon as she turned the breaker, my heart stopped fluttering and went still. And I didn't even notice it. It wasn't like I had tachycardia or anything, but I felt the physical sensation of the change. So it's very real. <laughs> Absolutely. And these teenagers who keep their cell phone under their pillow to hear if a cell a text message comes out. By the brain, there's glucose metabolism studies that show the, the length of distance from your brain absolutely affects brain glucose metabolism. And it's exponentially. So if you have your phone right next to your head, it's a very, very bad situation. <laughs> yes, I, I recommend getting like a battery powered uh, alarm clock, you know, rather than using your cell phone. People tell me, yeah, it's right by my head because I use it as my alarm. Uh, I think there's going to be serious unintended consequences from that. So potential genomics, the CACNA1C that we talked about, uh, making sure you have enough superoxide dismutase, NOS is working okay, and you have enough glutathione. Of course, the epigenetics is the uh, the EMF. I'll never forget, I, I heard a, a lecture from uh, Dr. Sinatra, and he said, if you come to our house, we have princess phones on the wall. So. I love it. <laughs> so magnesium, witch hazel, melatonin, rosemary that we talked about, and superoxide dismutase. And I think, you know, so many people are using, uh, you know, they have like Netflix and they stream it to their television. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea to have your TV wired rather than streaming it, because you're exposed to so much EMF when you do that. It just adds up. So anything that you can do to decrease. And I noticed rosemary is coming up over and over and over again. I'm a 20 year, 19 year breast cancer survivor. That's a big one for breast cancer. And there's no doubt there's a connection to this pathway because of the DNA damaging effects, right? Oh, absolutely. Because it's taking care of that uh, peroxynitride. Now, glutathione, most people know about this, major antioxidant. It neutralizes superoxide. It neutralizes hydroxyl radicals. It's one of the powerhouses of the cell. It regenerates vitamin C and E. It's involved with detoxification, aging and degeneration. As we age, our glutathione levels go down. So we tend to think of glutathione, cool, the more, the better. And I'm sure, Dr. Jill, have you ever given someone glutathione and they had a negative response to it? Oh, yes, Bob. And that's, a, that's my story. And I just had a colleague just talk to her. I said, I was like that for two years. So tell us more because I'm one of those people. Yes. Well, here's what happens. Glutathione, and we just for up here, we just show how it's made for fun. It's, you know, N-acetylcysteine. Up here would be uh, your glutamate, uh, your glycine. And then the GSS enzyme makes your reduced glutathione. And then glutathione through glutathione as transferase uh, does what's called phase two glutathione conjugation, where we take out toxins and we put them in the stool or the urine. And then also glutathione peroxidase neutralizes free radicals. So we tend to think the more, the better. However, some people take glutathione and they're like, that is the most wonderful thing I've ever had. And then other people are like, I can't take that. I feel horrible when I take that. So let's look what happens. Glutathione, does its job, donates an electron, and it becomes GSSG or oxidized glutathione. Look what oxidized glutathione does. You've heard this before. Combines with oxygen to make superoxide, then chews up more of your nitric oxide to make peroxynitrite. Oh no. And then we have to even use some glutathione to deal with that. Here's why I think NADPH is so critical and not enough people are looking at it. NADPH donates an electron to the oxidized glutathione to take it back to the reduced. That and here again, these are just some of the things that'll make the glutathione, I'm sorry, the uh, NADPH, and I'll be talking later about the NADPH steel. So when you take glutathione and it doesn't recycle, you have a problem. Isn't that fascinating? That makes so much sense. Um, I, I find that when we do give people the donors to make NADPH, it does help with these pathways. So. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why I believe that we have to learn if somebody has an NADPH deficiency mm -hmm. and support this before we start putting this in. 
I was just going to say that first piece is often not what you think of, like you said, with the, your analogy, the house and the fire and what to do first. I love that because many practitioners are just this um, protocolized thing where it's glutathione and liver support and detox and patients aren't ready for that if they don't have the nutrients in place. And with your genetic testing, people, you can tell exactly what things people might need more of beforehand. Mm -hmm. And the most common thing I see and those that are suffering the most They've got either NOS uncoupling mm -hmm. or Fenton reaction along with NADPH deficiency. Mm -hmm. Most common thing I see. So we need to look at some of the enzymes that are involved in making NADPH. I didn't mention in that chart, but there's something called NERF2 and KEEP1 that controls all the glutathione and NADPH genes. GSR, I should mention that, that is the enzyme that uses NADPH. So even if you have enough NADPH and GSR is not working, this isn't occurring. Double whammy is NADPH deficiency and GSR problems. So glyphosate again can be a problem. Nicotamide mononucleotide, Pautiarco helps NAD, NADH to NAD plus. Grapeseed extract helps the quinolinic acid move down the pathway. And then a few things for NERF2, milk thistle, broccoli seed extract to support NERF2. But again, if you support NERF2 too quickly, it can actually put people into inflammation. Mm -hmm. So again, sometimes it's like NERF2, yes, it's so important. People support it and they get worse. All right, now this is probably the most important thing I'm going to talk about. NOx, NADPH oxidase, my favorite subject. And I've been talking about this for two years. It's the only enzyme that its sole purpose is to make superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Now we tend to think, well, why would it do that? Well, again, the wisdom that God put in the body is absolutely astonishing. So when we're hit with a bacteria or some other pathogen, the body says, whoa, -oh, we got a problem here. We need to create some superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, stimulate some mast cells, stimulate some cytokines, make some histamine, Mm -hmm. and let's go in for the kill. If we didn't have that, we'd die of infection mm -hmm. in animal studies where they take it out. So this is an important process. I give the analogy, it's kind of like the military. You want a military that protects you, but you don't want a military that's turning the guns on the citizens. And one of the areas that we're researching is, are epigenetic factors stimulating this NOx enzyme to start shooting when there isn't an enemy? And that's one of the areas that we continue to, uh, to research. Now, we're really going to bend your mind with this chart. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this one over where we can look at it just a little more closely. So NOx enzyme, it's needed to create this cytokine storm and mast cells when, when we are faced with, uh, with an outside invader. However, histamine will make it go. Oxalates mm -hmm. will uh, stimulate it. Excess iron will stimulate it. Glutamate will stimulate it. Smoking or particulates will stimulate it. Aldosterone that I'm going to speak about in a minute stimulates it. Homocysteine, dopamine, sulfites, and something called mTOR stimulates it. So when it gets stimulated, it gets oxygen from iron and a molecule from NAD, or an electron from NADPH. Now, keep in mind, we just learned, we need NADPH for nitric oxide. We need NADPH for glutathione. We need NADPH for thriodoxin. So that's why I coined the phrase, the NADPH steel. This NADPH is being used excessively to create this storm. So then it creates the mast cells, and here's mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. Here's Lyme disease, yeah. EMF, xenobiotics. The mast cells will then create cytokines, stimulate these interleukins, tumor necrosis factors, and histamine. All good things when we're fighting a battle and we have somebody to take care of, to take out. When it's running amok, we have a problem. Now, this is some of the latest research that I think is very exciting. We have something in the body called renin, and that stimulates angiotensin 1. The ACE enzyme makes angiotensin 2. That stimulates the aldosterone, 
that then stimulates the NOx enzyme. And of course, we know this is what's behind hypertension. Mm -hmm. There's an enzyme called HMOX that calms this down. When people have mutations in HMOX, they can't calm this down. Now, there's an enzyme called ACE2 that takes these pro-inflammatory vasoconstrictive molecules and turns them into angiotensin 1-7, which is vasodilative in anti-inflammatory. As a side note, COVID-19 comes in using ACE2. I was just going to say, I know where you're going with this. Because <laughs> a lot of the side effects we see are from that vasoconstriction, correct? Absolutely. So this angiotensin 2 then stimulates interleukin-6, which is behind the cytokine storm. Yes. Interleukin-6 stimulates NOx, and it goes around. But here's what's really exciting. Just presented this to my doctors last night uh, at a webinar. Histamine, mast cells, and peroxynitrite. Remember, whenever you have superoxide, you're going to get peroxynitrite. Hold on to your hat. Stimulate renin. Wow. And here we have a positive loop that just feeds upon itself. High glucose, peroxynitrite, histamine, conflicting information on dopamine, but also testosterone stimulate the renin. You know, this might be one of the mechanisms uh, behind the cytokine storm. And so, for example, if something kicks this off, like if a child with, uh, you know, gets a strep infection and then goes pans pandas, or as you said earlier, we're not anti-vaxxers, but if you get aluminum mm -hmm. and the aluminum stimulates this, this could be one of the mechanisms that causes that to feed upon itself. Now, what's interesting is that nitric oxide and oxytocin calm down NOx and mast cells. And if your nitric oxide is being destroyed, mm -hmm. we don't have it. And of course, oxytocin, the love hormone. Yeah. So go hug somebody or at least uh, hold your cat or your dog, okay, to well, get your oxytocin. About, uh, we've had social isolation for two months and starting to come back, but we're not frequently hugging one another. Hugging is one of the main mechanisms that's not breastfeeding or sexual that increases oxytocin. I've said for months, I've said, yes, I agree with what's happening. We need to take precautions, but we're not thinking about the fact that social isolation is a huge risk factor for immune dysfunction. And now you're telling me it's a huge risk factor because you have less oxytocin production for the blocking of this enzyme. Absolutely. So I'm really excited about this pathway. And, uh, and clearly, there's way too many genes to go in here. But these are all the genetic mutations that could contribute to that. Here's all the epigenetics that could combine to it. And then luteolin, PEA, Boswellia can calm down the mast cells. Nettle leaf, quercetin can support the, uh, the histamine response. Methylation support of elevated homocysteine. Mm -hmm. And as we said, mold remediation, so important. Air purifiers superoxide dismutase, and we spoke about those before, that can support, uh, the, uh, that can support the NOS enzyme. So I believe this might be behind why we're seeing such a rise in autism. Dr. Thea Hardy's from Tufts University believes that mast cells are behind stimulating the hypothalamus. That may not be the whole answer, but there's the potential that that could be an issue and needs to be, uh, to be researched. So I think for anyone who's doing functional medicine, trying to determine if any of these factors is upregulating this is uh, critical. And now you can see why I call it the uh, 3D chess game. I was going to say, under. Bob, that is a key. Go back one more time to that slide. I want to hear your, get your contact. But we have a minute, and this is so key. I just want to hone in on this. I'm having about 101 ahas now as I think about this. I think about what we just went through with the pandemic and have ongoing and the types of risk people have, whether it's predisposition, diabetes, heart disease, has to do with a lot of these pathways. And the same cytokine pathway is active with lipopolysaccharide endotoxemia, which is a long technical word for leaky gut when you have bacterial coatings leaking into the immune system. They stimulate the same IL-6 pathway as well. And I feel like a lot of the risk factors we're seeing with heart disease, diabetes, um, age, they're more likely to have some of these things, I think, already primed. And then you just gave us a list on that other slide of uh, the allergies and mycotoxins and Lyme disease. And these are all likely to lead to more inflammatory states, more risk of infection, and probably more risk of the virus being an issue. Absolutely. And that's why sometimes 
bodybuilders or those who are trying their best to keep their testosterone high and stimulate their mTOR mm -hmm. may be at the highest risk right now. Wow. Yes. Now, one of the things we just heard uh, was that there was a drug that was discovered in, uh, in England that seems to get people out of the cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. We immediately researched this, and what we found is it inhibits the NOx enzyme. Wow. Yes. <laughs> wow. And I think you sent me that study. I remember us talking back and forth. Um, and if not, I would love to see the re research. It sounds so familiar because of perioxynitrate and the uh, cytokine storm, because really this is such kind of like the cell danger response. It's almost like we're all looking in our areas of the same thing and describing it, but it all comes together with such cohesiveness because it makes sense. And as we went in the very beginning to pull it back together for a practical takeaway, otherwise this is overwhelming. First of all, if you can get with a functional medicine doctor, especially one that's been trained by Bob, they can help you walk through these pathways. Um, and I know Bob does consults himself, and but mainly, do you mostly teach doctors, Bob? Do you do? Um, yeah, mostly. We uh, we have online certifications for the doctors, and uh, I do a lot of one on ones with doctors, uh, where they'll they're like, Bob, I need help with this, and I'll you know walk them through it uh, to give them the uh, the guidance they need. And I can just say, if someone is a doctor yes. uh, and they're interested in the software, there's the website dnasupplementation.com. Yvonne Lucchese is the executive director; she can help. Perfect. And if someone wants to contact our office, uh, there we are, Tree of Life Health. Uh, there's our phone number and our, uh, and our website. And then also there'll be links there to our conference, September 18 to 20. And I have an online certification course for doctors that walks them through. Like we have probably around 30 hours of instruction that step-by-step -step takes them through that NOS uncoupling, the glutathione, the, uh, the, uh, the mast cell activation. So if doctors want to learn this, we have a resource for them to, uh, to learn this. Excellent. And Bob, I'm going to share this with my practitioner list. And I'm going to ask you guys, if you're listening, if you have a doctor, you know, you know him on Facebook or another medical provider or um, someone who is in the functional medicine realm, um, please share this information, share this lecture with them. I think everybody should get to know Bob Miller. He is one of the brightest stars out there. And what I love about Bob is you can tell he's brilliant. I love talking pathways, but even more than that, he's got a really great heart. Um, he really cares about people. He cares about finding solutions. And I just, every single time we talk, Bob, I learn something new. I am so grateful for minds like yours and hearts like yours that are out there just continuing to do the science because this is the kind of thing that really pulls it together. And as we both know, this is the only real thing that's gonna change our system. A drug itself might be a potential solution, but a drug is not gonna help the 100% of the population because of these genetic variations. So we have to have solutions that are more personalized. Absolutely, and let me also say, I think the world is very fortunate that you're out there uh, leading the way and helping educate so many doctors. I think when the books on functional medicine will be written, uh, there'll be a large part uh, talking about uh, Dr. Carnahan. And, you know, you have a beautiful heart as well that uh, you want to help people get well. And uh, so the utmost uh, respect and admiration for you. Thank you so much, Bob. This has been a real treat. Please uh, be sure and share. I'm going to include in the links the things that you saw on the slide as well. So if you missed it, you can also watch this again, but I'll be sure and include that all. Thank you. Everybody.